Hey there, and welcome back to the Amateur Extra License Exam, Element 4. We're in sub-element 3 alpha. What is the approximate maximum separation measured along the surface of the Earth between two stations communicating by Earth, Moon, Earth? The answer is 12,000 miles if the Moon is visible by both stations. Now, if you're thinking Earth, Moon, Earth as something like this, you know, back in the day, that was some Earth, Moon, Earth stuff. Folks had big dishes in the backyard. But now folks are using directional Yagis and all kinds of stuff. And this is what one of those Earth, Moon, Earths would look like. So at the top, you have the transmitting station. They can see the moon. They bounce it off. A smaller version... Uh, approximately 1% uh, and what doesn't get reflected by the mountains and the valleys and the rocks is reflected back at that same angle, the incidence angle, and is received by the person on pretty much almost the other side of the earth. Now that moon is way out there at 238,900 some odd miles. Earth's diameter at the poles is about 7,900 miles. And the entire circumference there is around 24,850 miles. And they're all within about 100 miles, whether it's across the equator or across the poles. And so the earthly distance is approximately half of that circle. So you can use pi times diameter and divide by 2 if you want to. And that's how you arrive at that answer. So let's go back to the test now. So that takes care of question number one. Question number two, what characterizes libration fading at an EME of an EME signal? Now, just think of it as libration, as vibration, a fluttery, irregular fading. That is libration. When scheduling EME contacts, Earth, Moon, Earth, which of these conditions will generally result in the least path loss? And that is when the moon is at perigee. And if we, if we look back to this picture here, if the moon is at perigee, it's closer to the Earth. Now that's going to limit the, the amount of distance that you can travel, but... If it's at perigee, you have a bigger target, it's closer, so there's less distance for your signal to travel, therefore less loss. I was reading last night, I think the average distance traveled by Earth, Moon, Earth at this, at this distance uh, of being pretty much halfway around the world is about 500,000 miles one way. So your, your signal is going to have to, I think it was said like two something seconds to make that travel is, is, is pretty killer. 2.7 seconds, I think was the number. And so the next one, perigee, looks like this. Perigee, the moon is only 363,000 kilometers away. At apogee, it's 405,000 kilometers away. So there's a greater distance at apogee. And so there's going to be more loss, but you can get more distance out of it. And per perigee, got a bigger target too. All right, let's go back to the test and see what else we have here. In what direction does an electromagnetic wave travel? It travels as a, at, at a right angle to the electric and magnetic fields. And a right angle, even the electromagnetic fields are at right angles to each other. The magnetic field is at a right angle to the electric field. But then you can see the direction of propagation. And that is how, uh, if it's in the E field, I believe it's the E field that is the polarization. So this must be a horizontally polarized antenna, but you can see what direction that propagates in. How are the component fields of an electromagnetic wave oriented? They are at right angles. And that's what we just saw just then 
was that the electric field and the magnetic field are at right angles to each other. What should be done to continue a long distance contact when the maximum usable frequency, that's MUF, for that path decreases due to darkness? And that is to switch to a lower frequency HF band. I've got a nice little picture of this too. LUF is the lowest usable frequency. MUF is the highest usable frequency. So you can see during the hours of nighttime, the lowest usable frequency goes up. If, if your uh, frequency that you're using is above the maximum usable frequency, it's going to slip right through the atmosphere. And you can see the pictures behind that too that we're going to get into in just a minute. Atmospheric ducts capable of propagating microwave signals often form over what geographic feature? Atmospheric ducts are going to happen over large bodies of water. Mainly, that's because large bodies of water tend to retain heat longer than air. So there's going to be a warming over large bodies of water. When a meteor strikes the Earth's atmosphere, a linear ionized region is formed at what region of the ionosphere? We're just going to remember that that is the E region, the E region. So here's what the atmosphere looks like, the ionosphere, during the day and during the night. You can see that during the day, the F region splits into two sections. You have F1, the lower one, and F2, the higher region. Then you have the E region, and then you have the D region. And the E region is where that, that extra ionization is going to happen. Let's transition back, see what else we've got. Which of the following frequency ranges is most suited for meteor scatter communications. And that's going to be 10 meters through 2 meters. So that would be 10 meters, 6 meters, 2 meters. That's your answer, 28 megahertz to 148 megahertz. And that's what you're going to bounce off of those media scatter clouds, I suppose. What determines the speed of electromagnetic, wa electromagnetic waves through a medium? This is the index of refraction, the index of refraction. I've done a nice little math thingy here for you. The index of refraction is the letter N, and it's just a ratio of the velocity of light in a vacuum and the velocity of light in a medium. So I picked diamond because I found this number to be quite astronomical compared to air and water, and rearranging the formula, we get velocity of what we're, of the light that we're looking for that's passing through C divided by N. And so you have 300 million meters per second divided by 2.417. So light only travels at 124 meters per second through diamond. That is the index of refraction. Uh, usually that's going to be a constant unless you have a tool you can measure the speed of light. What is a typical range for tropospheric duct propagation of microwave signals? That is going to be approximately 100 miles to 300 miles. You should hopefully remember some of that from your technician license exam. Question number 12, what is most likely to result in auroral propagation? Well, the aurora is caused by the wonderful atmosphere being bombarded by the sun's magnetic throw up. And so as that, as, as our um, magnetic field gets disturbed, then it causes some of that auroral propagation. You might see aurora and then you can propagate some cool things through that. So which of these emission modes is best for auroral propagation? And that is CW. 
And there is a movie called Frequency with Dennis Quaid, and they kind of they 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 kind of played off of that. They didn't use Morse code because it was a movie, and who how many people would watch it if it was in Morse code? But um, he did do some magic through auroral propagation. And the last question of this section: What are circularly polarized electromagnetic waves? These are waves with rotating electric and magnetic fields. And I have one last image for us to look at here. You can see that there's a linear polarization. I suppose that's the normal one. Then you have circular polarization. And this one just happens to be the right-hand polarization. So you can see that those fields are spinning around. There's another one called elliptical. And I think that one does come up. A little bit later in our studies. So this concludes section 3 alpha, sub element 3 alpha. I'm Robbie W1RCP. Make sure you like this video and subscribe to the channel to show your support. I certainly appreciate it. 73.